Tragedy plus time. Time often makes tragedies just a little, and I stress the word little, easier to take. But then you're left wondering, have we used that time as best as possible? And it's certainly a question we asked yesterday as we marked 11 months since the school shootings in Newtown and the fruitless push here for more gun safety laws. And then there's another anniversary approaching. December 7th, it will mark 20 years to the day since the Long Island Railroad massacre. A gunman opened fire on a train, killing six, wounding 19, an event that scarred the nation in an era before Columbine, before Newtown, before these shootings, felt frankly like such regular events. Now, a new film is out, and it is looking at the lives lost in the massacre, the others that were changed forever, and the 20 years that have gone by. And for more, as we approach the 20th anniversary of the Long Island Massacre, we are joined by Charlie Min. He's producer and director of the documentary called Long Island Railroad Massacre, and it opens today. Charlie, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You know, um, I remember um, covering this. Uh, I remember at the time uh, the outcry that came out after it because it was to that point in a pre-9-11 America something people couldn't even consider. Um, and it was the worst uh, violent crime before, obviously, September 11th that we had in recent memory. Uh, did it open old wounds for folks when you talked about this? I know you got a lot of the principals involved who made it pretty clear to you there has not been such a thing called closure since this. But I'm curious, the reaction from the principals nearly 20 years later, what was it like? Well, after 20 years, uh, things change. Uh, some people open up more. Some people are still very reticent about the crime. The victims that took part wanted to take part. They wanted to represent uh, the person that they lost, a, a loved one. And they were very frank. And these interviews are gut-wrenching. Uh, the interviews are from the heart, not from the lips. It's a personal thing for you, too. You knew one of the victims. Went to school with her, didn't you? I went to Herrick's High School in New Hyde Park, which is 10 minutes from the massacre. Uh, Mi Kyung Kim, a fellow Korean, uh, was executed that day on the train, 27 years old. She was pursuing a film and TV career at the time, and she lost her life along with five others, and 19 others were wounded in the attack. You know, Charlie, I'm curious, because this had so many issues at the time. Um, obviously, this is a mentally unstable guy here. We're talking about Colin Ferguson, the issue of guns, access to guns. Um, if anything, um, so many of those telltale signs that we saw that happened that day, that played out at the trial, et cetera, you see them. You see them at schools today in tragic shootings. You see them in mall shootings. You see them in so many things, the one commonality being access to a gun. Uh, for the people you talk to, and, and I guess there's uni uniformity, they're shocked 20 years later, so little has changed in terms of policy. What bothers them most? Just that, that here we are sitting 20 years later asking the same tragic questions. How could this, how could this happen? Why, could it, why did it happen? And here we are sitting 20 years later. You have Virginia Tech, you have Aurora, you have the Naval Yard in D.C., Sandy Hook. I mean, if Sandy Hook doesn't do it, then I don't think anything will. What is this country waiting for, babies to get murdered? I mean, when is enough enough? We can't even protect our children today. And these people who are complaining about we need more guns, they could be next. They could be the next victim of gun violence. And Carolyn McCarthy, who you mentioned earlier, she's been fighting the NRA for 17 years. The NRA, I mean, that's like going up against the 1998 New York Yankees. She hasn't passed many laws. It's been a, a very, very brutal fight for her. But she, she's hanging in there because she wants to represent her husband and her son, who was given a 15 percent chance in living, and he survived. The NRA keeps saying it's the person, not the gun. Let's say the NRA is right for a second. Let's say it is the person, but you still need a gun to do it. So this whole thing is a mockery. Talk about some of the other people. Um, if people get a chance to watch this, uh, they'll see Lisa Gambati, uh, seven and a half months pregnant at the time of the shooting. Um, and while there's been so many tragedies, there's also miraculous cases. And I guess she'd count as one of them. 
Yeah, Lisa Combati was shot in the hip. She was seven and a half months pregnant. And in the x-ray, they showed where the bullet landed. It was in between her spine and the baby. The bullet was lodged in between the two. So you talk about a miracle. And uh, Lisa Combati, thank God she's alive. And she's in the movie. She's very prominent, uh, representing her daughter and telling everybody what happened on that train. As I said earlier, the w interviews are just riveting from the victims, people who are directly on the train, witnessed people getting shot or got shot themselves. Uh, unbelievable, the interviews. You said you did this film uh, in part because you had a connection to it, but also it was a tribute to those victims, right? Absolutely, this film honors the victims and uh, is victim driven. Uh, the effects it has on victims. We tend to glorify the killer these days. It's really getting out of hand. A perfect example is the Boston bomber. Somehow this creep got on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, this animal on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. They're asking for 15 minutes of fame and the media is giving it to them. The media as a whole has failed. Uh, it's been a colossal failure. The victims are the heroes here. The victims should have been on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Sean Collier, the MIT police officer. And if we would stop giving these animals their 15 minutes of fame, perhaps we would see less of these shootings. You know, a lot of people saying just that. Um, finally, Charlie, uh, in the interviews you did um, with the Congresswoman, uh, Ms. McCarthy, when you asked her, when do you think things would change, she said she thought they would have changed after Virginia Tech. Are these people 20 years later any more hopeful? I mean, I thought after Sandy Hook things would change. Obviously, I was wrong. Are they any ho more hopeful uh, that there'll be a shock to the conscience of America that we can do better than we have right now in terms of the laws and the books? Sandy Hook was the proof. If Sandy Hook didn't do it, I don't think anything will. You have President Obama, and I don't agree with this man on too many things, but the one thing he did say I do agree with, regardless of the politics, something has to change. To that end here, we, um, we want to remind people they can check out this film. It's uh, seen tonight in wide distribution. Just go to LIRRmassacre.com, and you can see both uh, locations and showtimes to check it out. And I strongly encourage you to do so. Charlie, I appreciate a few minutes. Charlie Men. Thank you. 20 years, it's interesting. How how much has it changed when you try to protect residents and hard targets and then figure out soft targets and then people look at a train and say, can you secure a train? I got to imagine it's got to be the hardest part of the job. It is, and, and we rely, of course, heavily on cooperation. At this point, that's what you got to do. We have folks in Rockland County prepared to defend and help New York City. And they work together uh, with respect to radioactive uh, material that might uh, come down the throughway. And you have a huge population in Coles Rockland home that works in law enforcement, fire, and emergency services That's throughout right. the region. That's yeah. right. That's right. But <clears throat> it, it, it's, it's not like it was. I mean, this is, uh, it travels. And uh, there are dangers everywhere. Our, uh, the Palisades Mall, sure. of course, is enormous. Is, yeah. uh, uh, we had one incident there with a bomb scare, mm -hmm. and we literally couldn't get our uh, first responders in there because the traffic just, uh, and that's, you have to clear up all of these things that are, are yep. new, really, to, to law enforcement. It, it's very difficult. And schools. I mean, how do you, you know, I was saying to somebody, remember when we were younger, if there was ever a bomb threat, you figured it was some kid who was trying to get out of a test, and you were <coughs> sitting out there, and hopefully you didn't pull it in the winter because you'd freeze out there. Now, all of a sudden, that happens parents are going to the school, forget about whether it's real or not, they hear the words and they go and you understand it. It's just a, it's so different. And I, I can only imagine with limited resources and what are you gonna do? You're gonna grind a train to a halt? You're gonna have one entrance onto a train and have metal detectors? It defeats the point purposes of mass transportation, for example. It you does, know? quick story, 9-11 um, <clears throat> at uh, three o'clock or thereabouts, all the superintendents and the law enforcement personnel in Rockland say, what do we do? Do we open schools on September 12th or we close them? Law enforcement said, we cannot defend. We don't know how to defend it. And they argued that they should be closed. Superintendent said, well, we think we can keep them open. Ultimately, I made a decision to open them because we had to get on with life. Yeah. We had to get the kids into schools. You can't sit home. What were the pa parents who have to go to work? But that kind of issue is, is a real, honest issue for our country. You know, Andrew, there was a media question, too, about the role of media in this. Um, and the, the producer of the film said, if you don't publicize 
um, a lot of these people who obviously are unwell, but they are looking for their 15 minutes. They are doing in many ways the copycat, and he referenced the Boston Massacre. It's a tough spot for us um, because that's part of the story, but, uh, you know, I, there is logic to it, which is the more you talk about them and make them such a key component of it, you're in, in, in a perverse way validating what they set out to do. And it's it's tough because we try not to encourage it. We try not to give any, like when we, s we were briefly telling the story, we didn't mention the shooter's name from the LIRR massacre, and I'm not going to now. But the, I think back to Newtown, and immediately after Newtown, everybody tries to figure out why would somebody do this. And to do that, you got to figure out who that person was. Figuring out who that person <laughs> was starts with their name. Uh, so it, it, our, our innate sense of curiosity, I think, leads us to do it and maybe we should in the short term as we try to figure out what possesses somebody to do something like this. But then after that, leave them to the dustbin of history. Let it, let it go. And you know, Dominic, what I was thinking was, I remember <coughs> when this happened. It was inconceivable. Somebody going on a train doing that. And sadly, I mean, I can even point to Madrid, what happened on the train. It's a different kind of tragedy. You look at what happened with the Long Island, London Metro. I mean, I didn't even, I mean, that's top of my head. I'm sure if I worked at you talk about malls, you go to talk about Nairobi, you talk about what happened in Jersey, you talk about... But my, my point is, the, what so much has changed in 20 years. So much has changed about what doesn't shock the conscience anymore, you know? I agree with you. If we look back to when this happened 20 years ago, I think we all thought, with this piece of garbage that did that, that this was the worst that could ever happen. And come to find out, it was only the beginning compared to some of the things mm. that we were installed for, in store for with schools and malls and the way our lives have changed forever in terms of with guns. And it's rural, it's, it's suburban, it's urban. And, and, and finally, you know, Michael, the, the part of this was um, Carolyn McCarthy. Mm -hmm. um, that day in 93, uh, she was a mom. Uh, and her son and her husband went on the LIRR to get to work that day. Uh, her husband never came home. Her son was given a 15% chance to live and he had a miraculous recovery, but it launched her career and she's a congresswoman and a long-term one and a very respected. But she was asked in the film, did you think after that day, nothing would have changed when it related to a, a crazy person and getting, being able to access a gun? She said, I thought it would have changed after that. I thought it would change after Virginia Tech. I would have thought it would have changed after Newtown and many times in between. She goes, I don't know if it's going to change. Mm -hmm. and, and after the Gabby that, Gifford shooting, mm -hmm. yeah. they immediately contacted uh, Congresswoman McCarthy um, for a authentic perspective on this. And she was, in those interviews, those immediate interviews, we spoke to um, her, yeah. uh, uh, um, devastated and, and despondent uh, at the state of that issue. Mm. And, uh, that for uh, a whole nother night here, but uh, unfortunately, um, what has changed is if in the last 20 years, I think we'd agree, is just the frequency and the scope of these kind of things. All right, now for times and locations where you can check out this documentary, please again go to limassacre.com. That's the name of the film, and it opens in theaters today. All right, when we come back here, we're going to have a, more of a conversation here, and we're going to be talking to our county executive friend about uh, not only the challenges um, in today's day and age about being a county exec, but some of the inherent things in Rockland County, and uh, we'll also get a check as to how the fire is right now. Good news, I think, on that front as well. Well, stay with us. We'll be right back.